Hey everyone, I decided to challenge myself and create a retro engine like the one used in Wolfenstein 3D in 1992. However, I want to add something interesting to it, so I will be using a dynamic per pixel lightning. With normal mapping, I will use deferred lightning. All that without shortcut. Everything will be running on CPU, no modern engines or 3D framework. We'll be using approach similar to Wolfenstein 3D, so we'll be able to rotate only around vertical axis and move in horizontal plane. This way, the height of displayed walls will be influenced only by the distance from the player effectively simulating perspective. As a result, when designing levels, we can completely ignore the height component, treating our level design as straightforward 2D layout. We will begin by defining 2D array that will represent our map. In this array, a value of 1 or higher represents a solid object. These solids are represented as cubes, but we will only define the four walls, ignoring the top and bottom since they won't be visible in our scene. Value of 0 represents an empty space. We could implement a simple raycasting method on this 2D array, which would be great for performance, since the array naturally provides some level of spatial partitioning. However, this approach comes with a limitation. It restricts us to using 90 degree angles, making it much more challenging to create walls at different angles. To overcome this, I decided to use 2D array to define map structure, and then I use it to generate walls as 2D line represented by a pair of points. This approach removes the 90 degree constraint, allowing for more complex and visually appealing map design in the future. This example shows straightforward approach that will generate all four walls for each cube. But this would lead to many unnecessary wall hidden inside convex spaces. To optimize this, we can implement a simple check before generating each wall. For every direction where a wall might be created, we first check if there is solid space adjacent to it. If there is, the wall is hidden and can be skipped. If there is an empty space, the wall is visible and should be added. While this method isn't perfect and won't eliminate all unnecessary walls, it still offers a significant improvement. In my test application, I define 16 by 16 map. Without optimization, this map will generate 440 walls. However, with the simple reduction algorithm, the total drops to 160 walls. Almost three times better. It's a substantial improvement with minimal effort. Since this is a raycast based rendering, the next step is to generate rays. As mentioned earlier, the height of an object is determined by distance from the camera, so there is no need to cast a ray in the vertical plane. Effectively, we will be doing raycast in 2D. We will start by defining camera that will help us spawn rays. To define camera we need Position in 2D space Camera rotation around vertical axis Camera field of view Now you can spawn rays. This is a view I have been using for debugging. The green line represents the field of view. Spot where they connect is a camera position. Next view shows rays spawned within a field of view. How many rays we need to spawn and how dense? We want to determine what to draw on every column on the screen. This means we need to cast a ray for every X coordinate on the screen. Check in if it hit an object and how far away that object was. Let's place some walls in front of the camera and see what happens. We can discard the rays that don't hit any walls, while the ones that do, we will be using for rendering. By calculating the length of the ray, we determine how far the wall is from the camera. The longer the ray, the shorter the wall will appear on the screen, effectively simulate perspective. We can also use the distance for basic shading. Objects that are closer to us will appear brighter, while those further away will be rendered darker. We got rays and walls, but now we need to find out if our rays collide with walls. This can be done by a simple math calculation. Both rays and walls will be represented by line. Red one can represent wall, and it's defined by point A and B. Yellow can represent ray, defined by point C and D. We can represent point on each line using linear interpolation formula. In this example, any point between A and B can be defined by parameter t that is between 0 and 1. When t equals 0, we will be at point B, and when t equals 1, we will be at point A. Any value between 0 and 1 will smoothly move between these two points. We do the same for ray. To find collision point, both formulas should be equal. First we drop parentheses by multiplying. Next we simplify formula by extracting t and u parameter. We move params on one side. We need to find two values, t and u, and we have only one formula. At first glance you might think that's impossible. But remember that we are dealing with 2D points, so actually we have two formula, one based on x and second on y coordinate. Let's add variables to simplify formula. 
Because both formula matches the standard form of linear equation, we can use Kramer rules to solve them. And this is a code. This is our W value. This is our WT value. This is WU. Finally, we are using linear interpolation to find intersection point based on T parameter. This is how we use this function to find nearest wall hit by ray. This is a code in action. Green color marks walls hit by ray. And finally, first 3D render based on collision. And with some basic shading. Now that we have our walls in place, things are looking a bit plain with everything in a single color. Let's add some texture to make it more visually interesting. To do this we need to determine which part of the wall was hit by our ray. Fortunately this is straightforward with our linear intersection algorithm. The algorithm used t and u value to interpolate between start and end of each line. This value represents the relative position along the line, where 0 corresponds to the start and 1 to the end. By multiplying this value by texture width, we can accurately determine the specific texture column that the ray intersects. This is a result. And this is a result with depth shading. When we closely examine the render output, we notify significant bending on our walls. The image here shows a wall we are looking straight at. The red line indicates where we expect the wall's edge to be. But as you can see, the actual wall is not simply misaligned. This misalignment is caused by a fish effect produced by our Raycast engine. But why is this happening? To answer this question, we need to look at how we calculate length of ray. Because height of the wall depends on that value. This image shows camera looking directly at wall. Let's throw two rays. One aligned where our camera is looking at, and another one on the field of view edge. To draw wall correctly, without any bending, this ray should have equal length. We rotate one vector to align it with another vector. And clearly both vectors have different size. The vector on camera edge are longer. So wall height on edges are smaller than screen center. This is causing our fisheye effect. Instead of just calculating length from camera to a point, we should measure length perpendicular to our lookout vector. This can be done by casting vector onto that lookout vector. This can be easy solved when we use basic trigonometry. Our edge vector is represented by B, and look at vector by A. We need to cast vector B onto a vector A, and use this value as actual distance. We can do it by utilizing cosinus function. All we need to know is B vector length and an angle that the ray was throw. We have both values. This is the code we fix. And this is our result. Now we can upgrade our engine and play with lights. We have three main light components. Ambient, diffuser, specular. Ambient. This is the uniform light that illuminates all objects equally, regardless of their position or orientation. It simulates the effect of scattering light in an environment, ensuring that no surface is completely dark, even if there is no direct light on it. To get ambient light, we multiply ambient reflection of a material by an ambient light intensity. Both are scalar values. Diffuse. This component represents the light that is scattered in many directions when it hits a rough surface. It depends on the angle between the light source and surface normal, making surface facing the light source appearing brighter why those angles away appear darker. To get diffuse light, we multiply diffuse reflection on the material by light intensity and then by cosinus of an angle between surface normal and vector from surface to the light source. To get cosinus alpha, we can use dot production of two vectors. Specular. This is the light that reflects directly of a surface, creating a shiny spot now as specular highlights. It depends on the viewer position relative to the light source and the surface normal and it gave surface a glossy or shiny appearance. To calculate this light we need to multiply specular reflective of the material by light intensity and a cosinus of an angle between reflected light vector from the surface normal and vector from the surface to camera. This is final light formula. To reduce the CPU load in our simulation we simplify the lighting model by dropping the specular component and using only ambient and diffuse lighting. The light intensity for the entire wall can be calculated just once using wall's normal vector. This technique is known as flat shading, offer a good visual effect with minimal CPU demand.
Alternatively, you can calculate the light intensity for each individual pixel on the wall. While this approach requires significant more computation power, it produces superior visual effect. This technique is called normal mapping. To implement normal mapping, we need an additional texture that stores the normal vector for each pixel on the texture. These normals are in the texture space. Before we can use them, we need to convert them to object space, using TBN matrix. Normal mapping deserves a separate video, so we will not go into too much details. This is the code that generates TBN. We need to build this matrix for every wall. I want to change myself, so I will be going with normal mapping technique. Next, we need to choose between two rendering pipes. The traditional forward pass or deferred lightning. In the forward pass, lightning calculations are performed during the rendering of each object. For every pixel, the renderer computes the lightning effects for all relevant light sources in a single pass. This method is straightforward and has been used in graphic rendering for many applications. Deferred rendering, on the other hand, separates the geometry pass, where position, normal, and other data are stored in GBuffer, from the lightning pass. Lightning calculations are performed in screen space, which allow for efficient handling of multiple dynamic lights, through its present challenge with transparency and anti-aliasing. Because that we are using ray tracing and are unlikely to discard any pixel, we could stick with the forward pass. However, I have always wanted to experiment with deferred rendering, so let's give it a try. To implement deferred rendering, we need to store for each pixel its position in space, its normal vector and its color. These are the three components of different buffer. Position buffer stores the 3D position of each pixel. Normal buffer stores the normal vector for each pixel. Color buffer stores the color information for each pixel. Once we have populated all these buffers, we can perform post-processing on every pixel on the screen to calculate the light's effect. Floor and ceiling is a bit of a problem to handle with dynamic lights. In old-school implementation, it was possible to simplify things by simply drawing the top half of the screen with ceiling color and the bottom half with floor color. However, with deferred lighting, we need to apply properly shading to floor and ceiling, which means we must accurately fill the G-buffer with the correct values. The normal component is straightforward if we treat the floor and ceiling as perfectly flat surface. In this case, we can use a uniform vertical normal vector for every pixel. For the color component, we could adopt a similar approach by filling the entire buffer with two solid colors, one for floor and one for ceiling. I decided to fill one color for ceiling and chessboard pattern for floor. To create the chessboard pattern, I need the word position for each pixel, which I must calculate anyway, since the third buffer required for the third lightning is the word position. Determining the word position is the most complex part. We need to convert screen coordination back into 3D space. For each pixel on the screen, we first estimate the wall height needed to reach that pixel. To do it, we only need to calculate distance on the y-axis, from a point to screen center, and double it. Now we can invert the formula that we are using to convert rays into wall height. And finally, we can substitute our wall height with our point to wall height equation. Once we have the ray length, we can use the predetermined ray angle for this column to calculate the ray's direction. By adding this direction to the current camera position, we obtain the word coordination. This calculation gives us x and z component of the word coordination. The y component represents the height. It's 0 for the floor and 1 for the ceiling. We then use x and z component to procedurally generate the floor color, resulting in a chessboard pattern. Notice how the floor appears to be bending, similar to how our walls did earlier. This distortion is again due to issues with our vector length. To correct this, we need to invert the vector projection. However, instead of multiplying by the cosinus of the angle, we need to divide it by it. Addict dynamic lights. Static light can feel flat, and our implementation of deferred lighting allows us for much more. I have added two types of dynamic lights. The first light moves back and forth along the straight line, while the second follows a circular pattern. To add a final touch, I incorporate weapon animation. I start by finding a free weapon pack with a basic sprite animation. Then I create weapon list class to manage all the weapons in one place, along with a weapon class to store the current weapon state and frames. With everything in place, we simply need to render the correct frame based on the weapon state and the timing of the animation. Performance On my M1 Mac Mini, the final performance result shows 6 frames per second in Full HD and 23 frames per second in Quarter HD.
After analyzing performance, I found that the first lighting post processing had a significant impact on the frame rates. To address this, I implement multi core processing to boost performance. Each CPU core is assigned a portion of screen, allowing them to compute lights independently and in parallel. With the multi core optimization, the frame rate increased to 70 in full HD and 54 in quarter HD. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, please give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any future updates. See you next time.